it is a very great honor to be able to speak with you. Um, just I used to watch like a lot of podcasts of uh, a lot of your podcasts, a lot of the uh, the video calls you did with other people and stuff before I did this, just to make sure I had everything ready. I had an idea <laughs> of what you uh, what you talk about and stuff. Um, I did have a question for you. Sure. Though. So uh, your your channel uh, name is Ballet Man. I was wondering if you did ballet before. Uh, I did. I used to dance professionally. Um, oh. I totally forgot that was still on my YouTube channel. <laughs> be honest I, I made my YouTube channel like 13 years ago so I've been on YouTube for a while now um, and it was it was just kind of an inside joke it was a screen name I used to use on a lot of different websites it was a reference to the movie mystery men oh. ever seen that I have not no oh man What's it's it it's about? hilarious it's yeah. it's one of the first movies that was based on a comic but a lot of people didn't know that because it was funny so they just assumed it was a, a parody of the comic book genre but it's it's actually based on a real comic book called the flaming carrot but um the premise of the movie anyway there are these guys who have like really unimpressive superpowers uh-huh. and they form a, a super team of, of sorts and and they try to go out and fight crime with their their wimpy superpowers and at one point, they hold auditions, like superhero auditions, and a bunch of people with uh, crazy gimmicks show up, and one of them is um, Ballerina Man and his son, Ballerina Boy, or something like that. And it just it just stuck with me, and I thought, that's that's hilarious. I'm going to use Ballet Man as a screen name. And, <laughs> yeah. So I, I totally forgot that was on yeah, my YouTube no, channel. That's awesome, but, um, yeah. no, um, because when, when, when Google acquired YouTube, it changed the name to... Uh, to uh, Ramsey Dewey, so that's what I always see yeah, when, when yeah. I log in. So, yeah, yeah I totally forgot that was on yeah. there. No, I thought it was cool. Yeah. Um. So you're in China right but now. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it like? But yeah, to, to answer right? your question, uh, I'm still stuck on the dance idea. Oh, yeah, but uh, course, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I studied dance in college. Um, studied contemporary modern dance, but I also uh, danced ballet because that's uh. Um. That's basically how you get a job as a dancer after college is you do ballet because everybody wants to see the nutcracker at christmas <laughs> um not very many people are interested in the works of say merce cunningham or whoever unless they're really really into modern dance so yeah so sorry to cut you off there no, that's okay uh does do you think tr- uh ballet transfers over to martial arts in a way or does it help do you think yeah absolutely absolutely um and that's that's something i think a lot of people are starting to pay attention to more recently with um what's his name israel adesanya oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because he dances he's he does ballet oh. and you know and since he's doing so well in the ufc right now a lot of people are paying attention like how does this guy train what does he do um what is he doing differently than everybody else and one of those things he's very outspoken about is dancing yeah now I don't want anybody to get, to get the wrong idea. If you sign up for a ballet class, you're not going to be instantly transformed into style bender or anything like that. It's it's just anything that makes you a better athlete makes you a better fighter. Yeah. And dancing makes you a better athlete, especially in the sense of increasing your sense of bodily kinesthetic awareness. Yeah. So we have... We have a bunch of different senses. We we know about like the five senses: hearing, sight, touch, taste, etc. But we have all these other ones we don't often think about. One of them is bodily kinesthetic awareness: the ability to feel and sense your own body and to use your body and a sense of movement, and how to how to move more intelligently. Essentially, it's it's movement intelligence. So dance definitely helps with that. I feel like it would so, have the footwork as well, or? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the footwork in dance and the footwork in fighting is completely different. But um, what dance does, and and this is, this was one of the hardest things for me because I'm, what you could describe as naturally kinesthetically retarded. Mm. Like I was, I'm, I was the most awkward mover ever. Like um, the first dance class I ever took. The teacher said basically walk in a square pretty simple right walk forward step to the side walk back step to the side walk forward like that right so i'm thinking that's easy i can do that and i trip over my own feet and fall on the floor and everybody stares at me awkwardly i'm like huh so that just happened but um yeah so what dance did for me was allow me to overcome those hurdles and allow me to stop tripping over my own feet if you will a lot of people are gifted to the point where that's not a problem 
but but here's where it really goes into fighting is um dance is really competitive especially at the the collegiate level and the professional level because you have to audition for everything you have to audition to get in, into the classes at college you have to audition to get into the major or the minor in in, in college at least my university was mm-hmm. very very competitive and i started dancing at age 22 oh yeah like, i didn't start when i was younger yeah. I started as an adult after a near-death experience, and I thought, man, I'm going to do all the things I've always wanted to do. And one of those was, I want to try dancing. And I was always like, ah, maybe later, ah, oh, that's, uh, I'm too shy, whatever. And after, man, after you stare death in the face, you reevaluate, you reevaluate everything. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine. The priorities just change, man. And so I thought, you know what, there are only so many tomorrows, I'm going to do it today, so... Um, but yeah, in these auditions, what ends up happening is they show you a complex series of movement, basically like, um, maybe eight measures of eight counts of movement Mm -hmm. and it can be complicated and they'll show it to you once Oh yeah. (laughs) and then they'll say, all right, now do it. And sometimes you do it with a group and more often than not, you do it by yourself and Imagine for a moment seeing a complex piece of choreography, you know, eight measures, eight counts per measure, and it's a lot of complex movement in every measure, a lot of turns and jumps and twists and rolls and whatever. And somebody just saying, all right, Mark, do it. Yeah, no, right? I don't think I'd be able to. <laughs> yeah, if you go to like a typical martial arts class, like say a jujitsu class, yeah. and the teacher is like showing beginners an arm bar for the for the first time, what happens? They're like, can you, can I, can I see that again, yeah, sure. professor? Can can we see that from another angle? Can we see it a fifth and sixth and seventh and twelfth time? And he's like, sure, yeah. yeah. And um, they still do it wrong after that, oh, right? Yeah. So, being able to dance at that level is becoming a muscle mimic. Being able to see movement and then copy it instantly. And that is an incredibly valuable skill set uh, when it comes to fighting, especially especially when you do film studies, which I think every, every fighter who is serious about fighting should do, okay. which is, for example, if you're scouting out an opponent, you know, get as much film, recent film, as you can on the guy. And also as much film throughout his career so you can look for... Um, not mistakes, but look for consistent patterns of movement, like stuff that he uses now, that he used last year, that he used when he started out. Yeah. Because that's those are the ticks that will come out in the fight. Mm-hmm. Right? Not the mistakes he made yesterday or in his last fight or 10 years ago, but you know what is consistent about the way the guy moves. It's like a fingerprint, because everybody has a very specific movement style, as unique as a fingerprint. So... What dance training has helped me with a lot is with film studies and coaching. Being able to do film studies on my fighters' opponents, being able to do film studies on my fighters and my athletes and my students, and being able to do film studies on myself. Yeah. And that's that's probably the most important fighter to do a film study on is yourself. That's very true. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you said you were like, you had a near death experience. Was that, um, was that like the yeah. whole head thing? Like where you had, you had like a hole in your head at some point or was that, the uh, that, that was a different near death oh. experience, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, my last fight left me with compound skull fractures, a depressed skull fracture. My forehead was caved in, left me with a blind spot in one eye, but this was a long time before that. Yeah. Uh, at age 21, I had a, a case of appendicitis. I've been suffering from what uh, was explained to me as intermittent appendicitis for years, where I would have the symptoms of appendicitis, but then it would go away. Oh, yeah. And so it just kept being misdiagnosed as, oh, you just have like the stomach flu or whatever. But it happened again. I was like, I got another one of those nasty stomach flus. So um, it got worse and worse until, you know, it was just full on appendicitis and my appendix burst. Oh no. So man. Yeah, and that that can kill you if you're yeah. not treated, you know, in less than an hour, man, that can kill you. And um you know, if you get a, the appendicitis treated, if you get the appendix removed before it's uh before it bursts, it's minor surgery. You can be out of the hospital the same day. They can suck it out with the laparoscope like instantly and it doesn't doesn't even leave a scar, just a tiny little mark on you. Oh yeah. 
But if it bursts, oh man, it's the polar opposite. It's the worst, man. It's the worst. Um, so basically, they they cut me open. I got this in this incision scar on my belly. It's it's like you know six seven inches oh, long. Oh, yeah. um, they have to cut you open, take your intestines out, like I don't know, wash them off or something, tie them back together. I don't know, stick them back in, <laughs> uh, make some incisions. I don't really understand. I'm not a surgeon. But um, there were surgical complications from this. Uh -oh. So, you know, the removal of a ruptured appendix, it's complicated enough. It'll put you up for months. So I was hooked up to machines, you know, like this. Uh, had a nasal gastric tube in my nose. Had a, a tube directly inserted into my stomach, sucking out the acid. Uh, man, it was gross. I could see this, like, canister filling up with stomach acid. It's, like, green and yellow and stuff. And, that sounds painful. <laughs> um, yeah, and hooked up to a catheter and all this. But the worst part is when um, um, I got to the hospital at an interesting time in medical science because um, at that moment, doctors were, were encouraging patients to get more active. Movement as medicine as opposed to you know lying in bed until you yeah. feel better, which was the previous idea. And so as soon as I was able to physically stand, which was no easy task because I could barely walk, they pulled me up out of bed and had me hobble around the hospital, hobble because I couldn't really walk, holding on to the, uh, the IV pole. Anyway, I was in the hospital for like three months and um, I got out. I tried to go back to my normal life, tried to rehab and all of this stuff and relearn some really basic things like just breathing, for example. Yeah. When, you, when your abdomen is cut down the middle, like you don't know how important those muscles are until they're gone. Oh, yeah. Until you, you can't use them anymore. Then all of a sudden you realize you need your abs for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, and even breathing and speaking. So, anyway, I, I, I um, had surgical complications from that. It felt like another burst appendix. I had to go back to the hospital. Essentially, my intestines were... were um, uh, tying up into knots with scar tissue, they were closing off, and so the the food couldn't pass through, and it was just building up and building up, and my intestines were about to burst, like mm. almost like another appendix. And so I had to go back to the hospital. Very similar surgery. They had to cut my, you know, pull my intestines out, cut them apart, stitch them back together, stick them back in, staple them back together. In the hospital for like three or more months, and this happened again and again. So like. Over a year, I spent like over a year, like lying in a hospital bed, just wow. unable to move. Just and every time, man, it it got worse and worse. And the doctors were like, "We might have to put in a colostomy bag." And you know what that is? No, I don't. I didn't I don't. until <laughs> until I was in that situation, man. Basically, um, if your intestines don't work, hmm. if you can't poop, basically, yeah. they gotta like make a hole in your side and stick a bag in there for the fecal matter to come out. Oh, and wow, it's yeah. It is debilitating. I mean, imagine doing, doing, um, just living your normal life in that condition. Yeah. So, man, people, people with colostomy bags, man, my heart goes out to them in a big way because, man, I, I was almost right there. I didn't even know that was. But, a man, thing, worse yeah. than that. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, imagine all the worst case scenarios out there. They're possible. Oh, yeah. For the most part. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> but, um, yeah, when when this was finally all over and and uh, you know I was out of the hospital for the last time, I remember um, I was talking to one of the doctors and uh, the last doctor who treated me gave some gave me some really good advice, which is movement as medicine. He said, essentially, uh, this could happen any time. You could relapse at any time. I mean, that scar tissue could come back. So what you need to do is keep your intestines moving, and the way to do that is to move. Mm. Because your digestive health is directly related to, to how you move and how you breathe, and breath is related to movement. It's all connected. And I was like, "Wow, that's really interesting." So he said, "You know, right now probably all you can do is walk or hobble or, you know, limp around." Um, so after that, you know, uh, maybe lift weights when you can, uh, do a sport when you can, dance if you can, something like that. And I was like, "Those are all things I want to do." Yeah, yeah. And so. You know, when I was able to, you know, as soon as I could, probably sooner than I could, because I tripped over my own feet in that dance class, 
Yeah, I signed up for dance, and uh, yeah, man, that was one of the most difficult things I ever did in my life, because like I said, I was kinesthetically retarded, but I pushed through it, and I pushed through it, and I pushed through it until I finally you know, got accepted into the major, um, until eventually I ended up dancing professionally. Okay, so your so, major was in dance? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I actually um, studied both dance and Spanish. Oh, really? So, oh, so you're fluent in Spanish, I'm guessing? I, I am actually. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I spent some time in Argentina. I spent some time in Mexico, as well, and yeah, I studied Spanish in college, which is a skill that does not come in handy at all here in, in China. China. <laughs> but, but here we are. Yeah. What's so? Like yeah, you training? you were asking me about. Yeah, yeah, I was asking about uh, training in China. Uh, what's what would you say is like the difference between training in China and just training in the U.S. in general? Like, I'm sure kung, you were talking okay. about kung fu being different, or like not being yeah, yeah. what people imagine. Okay, well, it's the state of training in China has changed a lot in the last ten years, like a lot. Mm -hmm. So when I first got here to China, there was no, there were no MMA gyms. Well, there there was one, a, a, kind of like a little fledgling gym mm -hmm. up in Beijing. This guy named Ao Hailin, he was one of the first Chinese MMA fighters, had like a small group. They they kind of dabbled in it. He was trying to teach them what little he knew about grappling and so on. And there was a small group of Sanda fighters at the Xi'an Sports University mm -hmm. in Xi'an. And uh, they became the China top team. And that, that's where most of the Chinese UFC fighters have come from. They they uh, were dabbling in MMA and they had a, a guy, Vaughn Anderson, he's an American guy, went and trained with them and, and uh, started teaching them jujitsu and grappling, things like that. And yeah, they've come a long way since then. So like 10 years ago, it was a couple of guys in a couple of cities who were training for mixed martial arts. Outside of that, there were uh, there was Sanda at sports universities, that's, that's Chinese kickboxing with um, throws and takedowns. And that was about it. I mean, there were some very touristy kung fu places. Yeah. And if you search and search and search, and if you're really lucky, you might find an old guy who lived through the Cultural Revolution who actually, who actually knows how to fight. Yeah. Uh, but that's uh, man, that's rare. That is so rare. I met one of them in my entire oh, wow. stay in China <laughs> over ten years, searching and searching. I met one, one of those old guys who knew how to fight. Yeah. And, yeah, but when when I decided to move to China, first I thought, yeah, cool, I'm going to go train in Sanda, learn Kung Fu, all of this stuff. And um, I did have the chance to train at a number of Sanda gyms and uh, sports universities here, like I trained up at the Xi'an Sports University, trained at a gym in Jiangsu province, trained with um, the, the Liao City um, Sanda team over in Shandong province. Um and yeah, those were all great experiences. But the state of Kung Fu in China is weird. Yeah. It, it's weird because like Kung Fu is, it's well known, everybody knows what it is. And like all the old people, if you go out in the park, if you go out in a public square, if you go out in an apartment complex with you know anywhere to walk around, there are old people, and it's always old people, practicing Kung Fu forms, doing Tai Chi forms or doing um, tai Ji Jin, the, the sword forms. Oh, yeah. um, and they're always exercising. But the young people, not so much. It's it's very rare to see anybody under 60 years old doing Kung wow. Fu. Yeah. And like outside of, you know, the old people in the parks and outside of Chinese sports universities. So the sports university, they, they offer uh, Wushu, which is, you know, all the forms and whatnot. Sanda, which is the Chinese kickboxing, Shuai Jiao, which is wrestling, and then the Olympic sports. Mm. The biggest combat sport in China, which shocks a lot of people, is Taekwondo. Oh, really? And everyone's like, what? Taekwondo? But that's a Korean martial yeah. art. <laughs> the thing is, it's, yeah, it's the most popular martial art worldwide. And it's the most uh, popular, and the judo nerds are going to get angry at me for saying this, but it's the most popular Olympic combat sport mm. by far. It's got the most competitors worldwide. There are the most taekwondo gyms out there. So it's the biggest thing in China because they're all about winning Olympic medals. They want to be involved in the Olympic sports. 
Yeah. I mean, China is fiercely competitive when it comes to the Olympics. Like, man, there, there were there was this controversy a while back with their gymnastics team. Everybody was like, wait, wait a minute, they're too young. They're like trying to get an advantage by sending smaller people in there. So I don't know what the advantage was, but it was all over the news for a while. But they're super competitive with Olympic sports. So because of that, Taekwondo is everywhere in China. It's everywhere. I mean, if if you search, you, you can find a Kung Fu school. Like, mm -hmm. um, there were two pretty big but touristy Kung Fu schools here in Shanghai when I first arrived. Two. Wow. Outside of that, there were a couple of, like, um, Kung Fu instructors who, like, taught in their home or in their apartment. And not much else. Really not much else. Because, you know, at the time, Shanghai was, it was not known as, like, a, a center of physical culture. It was the center of commerce. It is the center of commerce in, in China. Shanghai? Shanghai, yes. It's the biggest city in China by far. And so it's it's the center of commerce, the center of of culture, not physical culture, and this uh, I guess I, you should say I should say the modern culture, and it's the center of art, yeah. if you will. So Sh Shanghai is very well known for those things. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to find like more of a a kung fu culture, northern China is where you have to go for that, like um, Xi'an. Um, uh, Shenyang, um, Beijing, that are Inner Mongolia. Yeah. Oh man, Inner Mongolia. That is like the wrestling culture of China. So, like all the UFC fighters who know how to wrestle from China, those guys are Inner Mongolians or very close to that area. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so, with the whole, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have asked you about this. Um, the whole situation with uh, Master Wong. And, uh, yeah. yeah how, did, how did that all happen? <laughs> okay. Well, y you know, I made all those um, MMA fighters try out women's self defense oh, yeah, videos, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people sent suggestions like, try this one out, try that one out. And a lot of them, a lot of them, I, I was like, no, nah, we're not going to do that because, you know, it's, it's like, um, a lot of times they, they would j just show, show a guy, um, like send me a video of some guy on the internet with like, you know, 12 subscribers who's not very good at martial arts mm -hmm. and, and they were asking me to make fun of them. I'm like, ah, <laughs> my goal isn't to make fun yeah. of people. It's to, it's to, um, you know, just try out like popular self-defense videos and see what happens. Cause the, the whole reason I started making these things, um, a friend of mine sent me the, that Marie Claire one. Uh, the one with uh, Lena Marty, who has since changed her her ways and and started taking legitimate uh, martial arts classes, which is awesome. But um, you know that Marie Claire video with those terrible self defense uh, techniques, and I showed it to my wife. I said, "So what do you think of this?" And she said, no, that, that, "That looks okay. That looks oh, like it would probably work." Yeah. And my wife is not a stupid person. She is highly intelligent. She's very smart. And I thought, "Oh man, if if my wife can fall for this." Anybody could fall for yeah. this out on the internet, and and so I thought, yeah. um, I I remember getting into a few like conversations on Facebook with people about this video, like all these women I knew were sharing it, saying, hey, "Girls, you need to learn these self-defense tips. This will help you survive." And I was like, "No, no, no, because if you do this, then this," and it got exhausting typing this stuff. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to make a video, so I can send them a link and say, oh, "All right, this is what happens." when you try this against even mild resistance. So we made that video and it, it, uh, it turned out to be enormously successful. Joe Rogan shared that video, which is the whole reason anybody started watching my YouTube channel. So oh, yeah, Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thankfully they, they started watching some of my other videos instead of just that one. But um, yeah, man. So, yeah, it's the Joe Rogan effect, man. That guy yeah. has a magic power to press a button of a mouse and grant somebody, like, a certain level of fame. It's yeah. nuts. That's crazy. Like, it's more power than any, any one human should have, in my opinion, <laughs> but he's got it. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, some, some people, I, they kept sending me these requests, like, do one on Master Wong, do one on Master Wong, and I didn't really know who Master Wong was. 
And so I watched some of his videos, and he's like screaming at the camera, "Somebody attacks you, rip off his nuts, beat them to him." And like, okay, that's not testable. That's I, I, I didn't even know if he was serious. Yeah. I thought he's a character. He's funny. It's, he's like you know Master Ken from Enter the Dojo. Um, I, I thought it was a comedy channel, to be honest. But then people kept sending me links, like Master Wong did this, Master Wong did that, and I, I started getting the feeling, wait, no, he's he's serious. And and then I started reading the comments on his on his channel and people take him very seriously. Like a lot of people really look up to Master Wong and they love him. And and, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about the guy because Master Wong, um, you know, I want to say he's he's a good person. Like he he does charitable. He does charity work. You know, he 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 gives to the poor. I mean, he's he's a stand up guy, man. Mm -hmm. So. But his rear naked choke videos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I watched those, I was like, "Oh man, something must be said about this," <laughs> because the rear naked choke is testable, it's demonstrable. And I thought, "All right, people want to see a video on Master Wong. I'll give them one." Because yeah. he made like twelve videos on the rear naked choke. You know, not just the defense, but how to do it. And he's yeah. he he was teaching it wrong, like just leaving gaps and spaces. And oh, yeah, if you don't squish the carotid arteries, you can't strangle anybody. Of course, yeah. And so essentially, I, the Master Wong video is a, um, a cleverly disguised rear naked choke tutorial. But people got all excited because, oh, it's Master Wong. He's proving him wrong. He's debunking him or whatever. And people get excited about them, man. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it got wildly shared and people went nuts. And Master Wong apparently saw it and got angry and made a 20 minute video oh, shouting, like, this idiot on the. Yeah, all oh, that. <sighs> called me an idiot like 50 times oh, and no. got really mad and he's like i'll show you how to do a rear neck choke and he grabs uh jim his assistant and he's just like throttling him around or, man poor jim my heart went out to him like leave jim alone master <laughs> wong just leave him alone <laughs> i didn't see that video <laughs> i have to see that now <laughs> that's funny that's crazy oh man it's 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 pretty intense man yeah. it's pretty intense like um master wong is an intense person he's got this intense persona like this intense angry persona but uh but like I said, most of the time I think he's putting on a character, but this response video, he was genuinely angry. Oh. Like he was just pissed off and it was like, wow, that is that is some intense emotion coming from this guy. Some people and, just and after, prove wrong. Sorry, what were you saying? Yeah, after that he made a, uh, a series of videos, like a whole new series of videos on the rear naked choke, <laughs> essentially um, – confirmation bias videos saying I was doing it right the whole time and this is why and this is why which was shocking to me because um, you know it's, it's such an easy fix you know just seal off the spaces and, and you're fine you know but instead of instead of learning from the mistake fixing the mistake becoming a better martial artist he made this series of videos like he'd go out there and um, oh man what was this one he did one with um John Hackleman, you know, legendary MMA coach John Hackleman, and, and he puts John Hackleman in one of his goofy rear naked chokes and starts like throttling around a little bit. And he's like, How does this feel? And John Hackleman's like, No, I don't like that. And he's like, See, it works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, anyway, yeah, Master Wong, do though. Not Master like Wong. Being proved wrong at all, man. <laughs> uh, no, they do not. <laughs> so. Man, there was a lot of angry backlash because Master Wong has some very faithful fans who love him to death, and they were they will go to war for him, man. And they uh, they would bombard my channel with all this, all these angry hate messages. How dare you insult Master Wong? He's our he's our hero. And um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, I was thinking it would just be like this one-off video, and maybe it would get like a thousand clicks or something, and oh, yeah, it turned into this whole big. <laughs> whole big thing and suddenly it's like you must fight master wong now fight 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 yeah. but yeah master wong has gone on record several times saying he will not fight he feels he he has nothing to prove or whatever and that's fine that's fine do you think although he actually at some point if uh it, or yeah it probably won't happen right 
Man, if Master Wong was up for it, I would take that fight in a second. Of course. You know, even though, you know, even with my skull fracture, even with my blind spot and all of that, I would come out of retirement for that fight. And I'll tell you why. Because it would blow up the internet and I would make a ton of money off of that, man. I would make more money fighting Master Wong on the internet than I ever made in my entire career as a professional fighter in five different combat sports. Oh, wow. In MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Sanda, K1. All of that together would pale in comparison to the payday from a fight with Master Wong. I mean, man. <laughs> wow. That would be a big one. I would definitely pay to watch that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he would make money off of it initially, but but I think I think one of the reasons he, he doesn't show sparring on his channel, and he, I don't know if he does sparring. I mean, I guess he probably does at some point because, you know, enough people probably approach him about it. But I think the main reason he doesn't show that on his channel is because when you spar, you look human. Mm. And people see mistakes. And people critique it. Like, if, if you want a criticism, if you want a, a bunch of criticism on YouTube, just post a boxing video. Because the critics of boxing are the most pedantic people ever. Like, show a video of you sparring, or you hitting the mitts, or hitting the heavy bag, or shadow boxing. And people will come out and say, you're doing it wrong. Your footwork sucks. So it true. doesn't matter if you're amazing. It doesn't matter if you show like 12 rounds of sparring where you don't, where nobody can lay a, a mitt on you. They'll still say, it sucks because it's different than what I understand. Yeah. So I, I think I think Master Wong is, uh, is afraid of that happening if he did show sparring or, or, or if he did get into a fight. And, uh, you know, even if he won, it would look so dramatically different from what he shows. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, he, looks like, yeah. he looks like a god almost when he does, uh, or he tries to when he's uh, doing his videos. And then if he spars you, for example, oh, my God. <laughs> It'd be a whole yeah, different man, it story, would... yeah. It would be radically different. It would look like a fight instead yeah. of you know this crisp, clean choreography. And and his his um, fans would suddenly think like, why does Master Wong look sloppy? Oh yeah. And that's a word that gets thrown around a lot by people who don't understand what a fight looks like. Because fights look sloppy, choreography looks clean. You mm. know. Do you, you remember Sage Northcutt when he was fighting in the UFC? Um, you know who that is? I don't know. When was this? Okay, Sage Northcutt. He he was a and his first claim to fame was as a as a kid on YouTube. He was doing all these cool karate forms and backflips and crazy spinning tricks and things like that. And he was awesome. Uh -huh. And a lot of the comments said, "Oh man, if this guy fought in the UFC, he would get killed instantly. If he fought a real MMA fighter, he'd get killed instantly." And then he became a real MMA fighter. But when he started fighting, he was wrestling most of the time. And you didn't see all the crazy flying, spinning, flippy stuff, yeah. which, you know, he was really good at. But, um, you know, he, he wrestled when he fought most of the time. And, and um, that confused a lot of his fans yeah. like, what? No, he's he's different. He's different in real life. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he won a bunch of fights when he started out. And, you know, then, you know, they put him up against, up against some very steep competition in the UFC. And then he moved over to one FC after that. But um yeah, that was confusing for a lot of his fans, I think. And I think the same type of thing would happen with Master Wong, even even if he is secretly a fighting prodigy. Yeah. His real fighting would look so dramatically different from, you know, the the stage fighting on his videos. So, yeah, for that for that reason I don't blame him, but um yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, nobody's perfect when it comes to that stuff. Um, what would you recommend, like, for, say somebody has never done, oh, crap, <laughs> say somebody has never done a uh, martial art before, and, uh, they're coming to you, and they're saying, I'm willing to do whichever martial art you recommend, just pick one, which one would you go for, would you go for, like, a grappling art, or would you go, I mean, I'm guessing age probably matters, too, at this point, right, like, a grappling okay. art would probably be safer for younger age, but what would you say for, like, an average, like, 21-year-old male, who has never done martial arts before and they want to get into an art, what would you recommend? Okay, man, I get this question so much. Oh, yeah. uh, to the point where a lot of people ask me, like, please pick a martial art for me. Please make all my decisions for yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and um, you know, I, I love mixed martial arts and I'm a mixed martial arts coach and I coach that sport and I think everybody should, should try it out. But um, 
not everybody loves MMA. Mm. And if you don't love it, you won't stick with it. So my recommendation is, is pick what you love because that is what you will stick with. Mm. Like I had this guy, um, he was an investment banker, you know, kind of a big shot in the, in the finance world. He came to me for a private training and at first he said, uh, I want to learn MMA, I want to learn that cage fighting stuff. So I said, okay, so started training him in striking and grappling, you know, to be a well-rounded fighter. And then he started just really gravitating toward boxing. And after a while, he was like, you know, I, I really love boxing and I don't really love the rest of it. And I said, cool, let's focus on boxing and just that then. Mm-hmm. And that's what he stuck with. And that's what he stuck with for years and years. And that's, that's what, um, I mean, this, this guy is one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life. Like, this is a guy who doesn't have free time. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, like a guy who's out there making multi-billion dollar deals all the time. And, yeah, man, people fight for a little bit of money in the cage. I mean, just imagine how much they fight figuratively and literally over billions of dollars, man. Yeah. So this guy had, like, no free time. So if he didn't love it, he wasn't going to do it. That makes sense. But he loved boxing. And so... That's what we stuck with. That's what we stuck with the whole time once he figured out this is what I love. So a lot of people, I got this interesting question from a guy a while back and, and uh, I actually made a response video, but it accidentally got deleted from my phone, sadly, because I thought it was a great video. And he said, um, all of my friends love UFC, but I don't. I kind of hate it. I love pro wrestling, though. I love watching WWE. But I'm kind of embarrassed about it because I, because I, you know, I think my friends will make fun of me because it's scripted. They'll say, "Oh, it's fake," and you'll love that fake fighting or whatever. But I love it. Mm-hmm. And so he felt pressured to like try to gain an appreciation for the UFC and and watch the shows with them. And he tried and he tried many many times. And he's like, "I still hate it." Am I doing something wrong? I'm like, no, not everybody loves MMA. Mm-hmm. That's fine, you know. But and it's fine to love pro wrestling too, because you know pro wrestling has a has a really interesting history, because it was initially catch as catch can catch wrestling. It still has the same exact rule set as catch wrestling, technically, mm-hmm. win by pin or win by submission. But you know it's sports entertainment now. It's scripted. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to say fake. It's it's scripted yeah, because yeah. they're doing real stunts. You know it's real athleticism. But. You know, I had this guy come to my gym once who was a huge pro wrestling fan, and that's what he loved. He didn't care about kickboxing or boxing or or any of that stuff. He loved pro wrestling. But MMA was the closest thing he could find to pro wrestling in Shanghai. Mm. And so I just went with that. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to teach you all of the legitimate pro wrestling submissions because some of them are just like crazy, fake, yeah. whatever. Uh, just for show, but some of them are legit. Like the half Boston crab, when you do that correctly, Jogoro Kano, the founder of judo, taught that technique. Oh, wow, yeah. He taught it yeah, to there's, you there's... specifically? Or... No, 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 no. But he old, died way yeah, before yeah, I was yeah. born, man. Yeah. Like he, he lived in the 1800s. But you oh, can wow. find an old film rule of Jogoro Kano, the founder of judo, the founder of Kodokan judo, performing... The Boston Crab, I'm sure it had a uh, polysyllabic Japanese name mm-hmm. uh, when he was doing it. But, um, yeah, that's a legitimate submission when you do it right. And uh, at first it looks like you're just using a lot of strength and muscling the guy. But it's all about leverage and pain compliance to move your opponent into, into that position. So there are a bunch of really cool things like that that have kind of been brushed under the rug because it's in pro wrestling. So people are like, oh, that's not legit. It's fake. It's fake wrestling. But... There are some real, real moves in there that are often dismissed and thrown out like the baby with the bathwater, if you will. Uh, so when people are like getting so, slammed on tables and stuff, is that all real too? Or is that like, <laughs> like camera tricks and stuff? You know, that's, that's, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure how the table thing is done exactly. I, yeah. think, I think it's like a pre-cut table, so it breaks perfectly okay, in yeah, half. Yeah. But... What's interesting about a, a pro wrestling mat that I didn't know, it is like much less forgiving than than the mats in, in MMA cages. Mm. 
Like it's it's wood with a very very thin layer of um, of padding over top. Very thin. Like compared to that, like the UFC cage is plush. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah. So when you see these guys taking these falls and they make those big noises and they stomp on the ground, it's because there's plywood under their feet. And they are taking falls on plywood, like they're they're falling off of like these twenty foot ladders, oh, yeah. landing onto plywood, sometimes onto tacks. Have you ever watched like um, not like high level pro wrestling, but like uh, local level pro wrestling? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And those guys do the craziest stunts, man. I, I had a friend who was a like a local level pro wrestler, and uh, they would do these crazy things. They'd like take nail guns and shoot each other with them, yeah, and yeah, that's and crazy. cover the floor in broken glass and stuff, and like fall on it. And it's real blood, real injuries and stuff, and it's it's a crazy type of masochism, man. What these guys do to try to generate uh, hype for their uh, for their events. Man, I would I would never never want to do that, man. Yeah, no. What would you say was the uh, worst uh, injury you've seen from wrestling or just uh, a pro fight in general? Oh man, from from wrestling, uh, um, like pro wrestling or or uh, MMA or any type of combat uh, just sport. Any type of combat sport in general, yeah. <sighs> the worst injury would be death, probably. Oh, you've seen? Um. <laughs> Uh, firsthand, no, I've seen videos. There, there was a guy, um, a guy I fought actually, um, and I can't remember his name, a Chinese dude I fought. He ended up dying in a fight, um, about six months later. Mm. And, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why it's probably because this, this guy was fighting like every week or twice a week or three oh, times a week. Yeah, that's not good. And... Yeah, when when you fight in China, you have the opportunity to fight a whole bunch of times as often as you want, and I, I did that for a while. Like I, I did, oh man, there was one week I did three fights in a week. Wow. And and when you're a, in a fighter, when when, you, when you're a fighter surrounded by other fighters with this fighter's mentality, you you feel like you have to do that stuff. Like you can't turn a fight down. You have to do everything. You have to take every offer you're given. Or people will just like look at you like, oh, you're not a real fighter anymore. It's it's a weird mentality when you get into this this combat addiction, if you will. And um, but yeah, this guy was fighting like every week, and um, yeah, he died in he died in the ring mm. or on the side of the ring afterward, actually. So I saw the video of that, and I was like, man, that's that that was sobering because I I you know heard of all kinds of people dying and in, in boxing over the years. Um, is there so much blunt force trauma to the head? It's it's bound to happen, and it does. It does happen. It's an inherently dangerous sport. But the fact that it happened to someone that I knew, to someone that I actually fought, yeah. Hmm. That's terrifying. That's that's yeah. a sobering thought. I mean, it's 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 not so much terrifying for for me because one thing I always say to people when they say, "How do I get over the fear of fighting?" is accept the fact that you you are going to die. You know, like uh, Miyamoto Musashi, he wrote that famous quote, the code of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death. But if you read the whole quote, he says basically, and I'm paraphrasing, everybody knows on a cerebral level that they're going to die. Everybody knows it up here. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, priests know it. Noble women know it. Kings know it. Peasants know it. They all know it up here. But warriors are different because they know for absolute certainty that they will die on the battlefield. They know it in here. And that's a big difference. Yeah. So the code of the warrior is different than the code of the king or the peasant or whatever. It is the resolute acceptance of death. You accept it. You know you're going to die. And so when you make peace with that, when you make peace with death and understand, I will die. And you know, cage fighters so far, you know, you're, you're probably not going to die in a cage fight. It could happen, but, mm. and you have to accept that. It could happen. You're, statistically, you're probably not going to die in a boxing match, even though it could happen. And it has happened. But when you accept that fact, then you can get over that huge hurdle of the fear of the unknown, if you will. That, that performance anxiety that holds people back so much in a fight. Uh, you made a really interesting video. 
um, one of your recent videos about, um, it's like, I don't remember the title, something like five things that will help you win your first fight. Mm. And you gave some really, really interesting advice, really good advice. Um, things that beginners don't think about, like breathe, for right. one. And what was the other one? Um, man, it's, I'm, I'm blanking on them, but they, they were just really, really simple things, like, that get you into the right state of mind. Because everybody thinks it's going to be a magic technique that's going to solve the problem for you. But with your first fight, especially like your first 10 fights, they're going to suck because oh, yeah. you're, you're not in the right state of mind. You're, you're afraid of dying. You're afraid of messing up. You're afraid of the cameras, uh, whatever it is. But yeah, so I really appreciate that, that advice of, you know, put yourself in the right state of mind I appreciate the more than anything. Thank yeah, that was, that was a great video. That was a, that was a fantastic video. So I, I really hope that one gets a lot more views. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, where was I going with that whole diatribe about uh, Miyamoto Musashi? Yeah, going back to this guy who died, the fact that like, I'm, I'm totally okay. Like, if I die in the cage, that's fine. If I die in the ring, that's fine. I've accepted it. If I die peacefully in my sleep when I'm 100 years old, I, I've accepted that. It's going to happen, right? But the possibility of killing someone in the ring, that, that was unnerving to me. Mm. That, that made me reevaluate everything. Like, okay, yeah. like I've made... <laughs> peace with you know beating somebody up a, a little bit to a certain extent but like killing someone going that far intentionally or unintentionally man that was that just put me in a dark place man yeah yeah like the first thing first thing i did outside of out of college i applied to be a special agent with the fbi mm. and i thought that's what i want to do i want to be a special agent want to want to you know work in law enforcement that kind of thing and so I started testing with the FBI, I took their math and cognitive reasoning tests, took the uh, physical fitness test. And, you know, it was all looking good. I passed all the tests. Um, they wanted me to fly out to Quantico and start training. And I was like, OK, yeah, this is wait, this is really happening. Wait, this is really happening. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is this is a job that requires you to carry firearms and potentially use them yeah. to kill people. Yeah. And the more I thought about that, I thought, you know what, I, I have not come to terms with that. Mm. And that is, that is not necessarily what I want to do with my life. And so it's like um, cage fighting, ring fighting, kickboxing, boxing, combat sports. It was a way to make peace with the violence without killing people, if you will. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know? that makes sense, yeah. So this fact that the... You know, the guy that I that I knew and had fought previously died in the ring was man, that was that was just uh it messed with my mind. It messed with my mind. So that's still something that I uh I I try to uh come to terms with. Did you happen to see the video? Uh, I don't know when Joe Rogan made it. It was uh, talking about how he was in a, I think it was a Taekwondo match. And um, basically, yeah. you saw it, and he like spin heel kicked somebody. And um, yeah. this person drops and doesn't get back up, and he gets hospitalized. And uh, he yeah. never got to see what happened after. It's crazy, man. Yeah, I saw that video. I watched it on repeat a bunch of times yeah. to try to figure out like how did Joe Rogan get so much power in that kick. And I, I figured it out, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a bit. You know, where he kicks him and he launches the guy into the air. And it's not the guy jumping back. He is physically launched into the air with that kick. And Yeah, yeah that's got to be a weird feeling where he, he doesn't even remember the guy's name, doesn't know what happened to him afterward. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know the, yeah. uh, the kick was out on YouTube. The actual kick was... Uh... It's... Yeah, you can see it on oh, YouTube. It's it's on his podcast, but it's somebody uploaded just that kick to to oh, okay. a YouTube channel somewhere. So if you look up like Joe Rogan Taekwondo tournament, uh, spinning back kick, it it should come up. Okay. But yeah, man, Joe Rogan's back kicks and side kicks are pretty much legendary on the internet at this point, and <laughs> and uh, you know I'm. I come from a Taekwondo background. You know, I did that for a decade, man. And that was my jam. And I felt like I had a pretty pretty decent back kick. And then I saw Joe Rogan's, and he's teaching George St. Pierre how to do it better. And George St. Pierre has a good 
spinning back kick. Like when he, he first time I saw him fight, he knocked back, you know, hit Matt Hughes with that. He lost the fight, but man, he 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 won me over as a fan with that spinning back kick. Yeah. It was so beautiful, so well timed, and Joe Rogan's was just levels better than that. But it's it's the lockout on the kick. Like the way Joe Rogan described it, it's about the spin to generate power. But it's the lockout, and I don't even know if he realizes that he's doing it. Essentially, when when he kicks, he locks his leg out like completely straight, mm. almost like you're holding the kick for like a split second and then pulls it back. And when you do that with a back kick or a side kick, it displaces it completely displaces the target. So as opposed to like uh, hitting and pulling it back, you lock it out and then pull it back, but oh, yeah. very very quickly. So it's it's like the best aspects of a punch and a push combined together into that kick. That's interesting. So, yeah, if, if you watch it again with that in mind, you'll start to see that lockout. And if you start to add that to your own kicks, man, it is game-changing how much more power you can add to it with minimal effort. I'm going to try that now. I didn't know if that, uh, that was even a thing. Normally, when I would, uh, at least when I first started, whenever I try to throw punches or whatever, they'd be like, don't push the bag. Like, make sure you're just snapping, tap the bag. But that's some, that's some solid advice. I'm definitely going to check that out now. Yeah, with, with a punch, yeah. You don't want to push the guy away. Yeah, you want yeah, to penetrate, course, yeah. right? But back kicks are different. Yeah. Because the back kick has multiple goals. You want to penetrate, but sometimes you also want to push. Mm. You can use that to knock them across the ring, to knock them on their butts, to knock them down. Um, man, I'm seeing a lot of back kicks right now in uh, Kunlun Fight. Um, it's, it's a fight show here in China, mostly kickboxing, but they do do some MMA fights. It's it's the biggest kickboxing show in China. I do uh, ringside commentary for them, oh, cool. which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so it's one of the best jobs ever. You got to sit ringside, watch fights, and just talk about them and get excited. And people people pay you for it, man. It's yeah. amazing. So man, I'm seeing so many spinning back kicks to the liver, ending fights mm. like these these guys up here in China and also in Iran. Like man, there's some great kickboxers coming up out of Iran coming over here to fight in China, like, I had no idea kickboxing was, was that big there. Like, apparently all the Iranian fighters are coming over to China to fight, and, uh -huh. man, they are doing so well here. And, but man, that spinning back kick, time to the liver, liver shot KOs, everybody's doing it over here. It's, it's like, it's like, um, I don't know, the new left hook is becoming the, the, um, spinning back kick to the liver over here it's it's nuts man how good people are getting at, at timing and positioning that yeah liver like, man i was <laughs> what were you saying yeah i was i was pretty decent with my spinning back kicks back in the day but never never that good where i could just like you know on the fly against a fully resisting highly trained opponent mm. you know get him right on the button every time and the accuracy on these guys, they can kick the wings off flies. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. man. Well, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your time. You want to shout out your uh, – I mean, I'm guessing everybody on my channel already knows you. But you want to shout out your, your social medias and everything? Sure, sure. So look me up on YouTube, Ramsey Dewey or Ballet Man. Just type in Ramsey Dewey. You'll find it. Um, I'm on Instagram now. I, it's a fairly new thing. I'm trying to figure out the internet apparently because I, most of my life I had no idea what it was. And so I got Instagram now, Ramsey Dewey. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I accept friend requests. Yeah. What else? Um, Chinese fans. I'm on Weixin or WeChat. Um, yeah, I do have a Twitter account. I don't understand Twitter yet. I think I've posted like three things there. Um, yeah, so that's me on, on social media. No problem. Thank you. And by the way, get out there and train.